store for today. Who is excited for Avatar The Last Airbender cast reunion? All right, let's waste no more time. Let's get these guests out here. First, first up, he needs to capture the Avatar in order to restore his honor. Everybody, voice of Zuko, Dante Basco! Hello, Zuko here. Just like his character, he's been gone for a little bit. But he's back, and so I need you all to give lots and lots of love, everyone. The Avatar Aang, Zach Eisen! How are we doing today? Hello. 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 <laughs> I had to get I had to videotape Zach's first panel ever. Introduction. <laughs> Woo! This is incredible. Oh my god. Zach, so I know this is your first convention appearance. Is this your first convention ever? No. Okay. It's not my first convention. I've actually been to a number of them, but it is the first time that I'm appearing. And I got to say, this, it's been incredible. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been amazing meeting all of you. And there's still two more days. I get to meet so many more of you. So, yeah. And how has it been so far? Have uh, these convention veterans given you any tips and tricks on how to survive this weekend? I'm very thankful for their <laughs> advice. They've been great to me. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a good time. Hydrate. I know. Hydrate. That goes for all of you, too. So I got to ask, how has it been reconnecting like this and then being able to be here and talk to the fans about this amazing legendary series that is Avatar The Last Airbender? Yeah, I mean, it's been great. Uh, I, Dante and I have seen each other a number of times over the years, but Jack and I, I don't think we've seen each other since, uh, like, probably the finale. Yeah, and the and the weird secret is it's, like, a reconnecting, but also, like, kind of an initial connecting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because we, we weirdly never recorded together. Specifically, Zach and I. It was all remote, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was He I was, was the, the voice in the York. air in yeah, the yeah. room. We were like, hi, Zach. He was the avatar. I mean, he's <laughs> elusive had his as own ever. thing going on. It was very important, like character-wise, that Dante never get in the same room as him. It was really yes. like fueled you. Creators did a great so job of making. They sure. made Zach move to New York so that Dante was kept separate. Against I finally found him in the streets of Brooklyn. <laughs> Who would have known? It was Brooklyn. <laughs> and you did find him and brought him on to. Um, the podcast, Braving the Elements, that you are doing with Avatar Cora, Janet Varney, everyone. Woo! So, and both Zach and uh, Jack have appeared. How has it been for all of you now to kind of go back and revisit this series at such a different point in your life? Super fun podcast. It's very fun to, like, book club this show, to, like, get to, like, watch it and, like, think about themes and then come on and, and chat through it. Um, I, I've, I've adored it and revisiting the show. Yeah, because like I watched most of it when it was airing, but not necessarily. It didn't like catch all of it and didn't. Um, so getting to like fully be far enough away to like kind of watch it fresh and not remember everything, it's a, it's a, it's a good show. I noticed. <laughs> I've, I've okay. clocked it. I'm like, oh, this show is, yeah, good. <laughs> Great show. Great show, yes? I, yes. <laughs> I think it's fascinating because us three here, we're all, um, we're all kid actors. And, uh, and now we're, we're grown up, kind of. 
Most of us. Most of us. And so uh, with kid actors, a lot of times you, you do things and you don't really look back at the things you do. You kind of just on to the next things like we all are in life, but in, in the industry. And so it's a very unique thing to kind of, with the podcast to... It's probably the first time in my life I really went back and really watched something. I was going to say, you still haven't seen the whole thing, have you? Not all of it. No, no. no. What? We just finished book two on the podcast. So I'm, I'm very fascinated to go book three. And so to really watch it, I do feel like I'm being tested sometimes by Janet Varney, and I feel like a bad student. But I'm that student that has good points that come Absolutely. in. Absolutely. All the time. Have you seen the whole thing? I have. And I think similar to you, as it was coming out, you know, I, I did watch a good amount of it. Uh, obviously, like, we had read all of the scripts and everything. But it was a little inconsistent. And it, it was kind of a really cool experience when it came out on Netflix, being able to binge everything and really just delve into the story head first, not have to wait, you know, so long in between episodes and seasons and books and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, it was really cool to just, like, really go dive head first into the story. It had been a very long time. I recently realized that there is one episode that I've never seen. Which one? Zuko Alone. Ah. I'm not really? in it. Just I because you're not in it? There's no, just because you're not in it? It didn't make seem any jokes to me. <laughs> I was just like, well, this one's not going to be funny. Uh, and then we were, do, we were doing like a rewatch on your Twitch, and yes. I legitimately just happened to miss that one. And then realized what? I, I Saka, always, what are we talking about? Right coincidentally, now? we were do whenever we would do we would do panels and stuff, and people would like talk in depth about like all the backstory that your character got and all the stuff about your mom. And I was like, like, "What are you? Where talking? are they getting this? <laughs> <laughs> what like deep internet lore, comic books have they read this all from?" <laughs> There's a whole episode about it. No, I'm learning this so much I don't I didn't know because my memory of the show is actually just me, May, and Jack mostly in the booth telling the story about how we saved the world with another kid in our air. I feel so left out. <laughs> All but I know later. we saved the world. I remember it vividly. Yeah. You're taking a lot of credit. You kind of jump in right at the end and help save the world. <laughs> Very like you sort of contributed a lot to the almost destroying of the world, and then right at the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are good, some good folks out there in the Fire Nation, let's not forget that, yeah. that need to... Like Wang Fire and his wife <laughs> Sapphire Fire. Really nice friend. It's a problematic nation. So you all talked about being uh, younger when you were recording this. At what point for you, Dante and Jack, did you realize, oh, this is a really big show, and then Zach, you were even younger. Did you process that at that age? Like how big it was becoming? We definitely knew it was good. I didn't, I never did I think that, you know, I'm 15 years later, I'd be sitting here in front of a packed house full of fans. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody really could have predicted that, but like, just even reading the scripts as a as a twelve year old, I was like, all right, this this is pretty cool. But no, I did not. Yeah, a couple like halfway through the season, realizing like reading season one scripts, realizing how like serialized and in depth the show was getting, I I was starting to at least appreciate like whoa. Um, and then for me, I was in college when the show was coming out, um, and starting to get peers of mine at college talking to me about it, which at the time felt incredibly novel that this like kid show, obviously we know now that Avatar is very like broad audience and like is a show for adults too. Um, but at the time it was like a huge deal when like friends were like pulling me aside to parties being like, hey, don't tell anybody, but I watch your show, it's good. <laughs> and I think the first time I realized it was really big, I went to Sundance Film Festival one year and we were in the snow and I ran into Jason Isaacs who plays General Zhao and Lucius Malfoy. Right, that's right. That's awesome. And the Patriot, and or the, the opposite of the yeah, Patriot? Yeah, the, <laughs> yes, all that bad, the ultimate bad guy. And we ran to each other in the street, and it's snowing, and we're at the, one of the biggest film festivals in the world, and he's like, Dante, man, that cartoon we did. What's it called? Everyone's talking about this cartoon. And I'm like, <laughs> and we're, it's just as ironic, because we're at a film festival. I'm like, I know, what's going on? He's like, everyone wants to talk about this cartoon. <laughs> Like, what about the movies we have in this film festival? 
that's when I was like, oh, this is kind of a big deal, bigger than we know. Because you guys got to realize when it came out, there was not the internet how we have it today. No one had, we didn't, Facebook, we didn't have Twitter, didn't even exist, any of that stuff. So it kind of happened in a, as we know, today, a vacuum. And then when it really hit again during COVID was an unprecedented thing where you're like, it's like the number one show in the world. Yeah. That was what? Crazy. Incredibly cool to have so many like new people join the conversation about it, get like new perspectives on it, get a younger audience re uh, energized about the show. Just the whole thing was, yeah, really cool. How many of you guys watched it for the first time in 2020 when it came out on Netflix? <laughs> good amount of you. That's good. That's great. Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and. <s> <laughs> And so for a while, we only did have the TV series, both, uh, both series and some comics, but now we're starting to get a lot more Avatar content with Avatar Studios announcing some movies. Who's excited yeah. for those? Mm -hmm. nah, Except all of those got canceled. Bam, April Fools, ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> got one. Even more exciting though is that we, now we have confirmation that the first movie will be Aang and friends, uh, so yeah. So theoretically, what would you, what kind of adventures do you think you would like to see those characters get up to in the movie? Go ahead, go ahead. I just think we need more, I want more time spent with the day-to-day -day operations of a tea shop. I thought that was one of the best side plots. <laughs> And I think we do a whole movie, Zuko gets back into that business, everybody's there to help, and we're just running the shop. <laughs> it's like Cheers in the Avatar model. universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like, you know, the love triangle between Aang and Katara and Zuko, we can <laughs> maybe investigate Stop trying to force that it, Dante, a little more. <laughs> settled batter, it is settled batter. <laughs> I'd love to see, like, you know, we, we, we got, the show happens over, like, a course of, like, what, a summer, right? So we really got, we, we delved in depth to that time period a lot. You know, between the end of the series and the start of Korra, we have, we have no idea what went on. So, like, let's see Aang grow up, right? And, like, if somebody's loitering and using, like, the Wi-Fi in the tea shop, like, how, whose yeah, yeah. job is it to remove them? Like... I think you'd be pretty good at that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And speaking of even more content, there is also now an Avatar RPG. Anyone play Avatar Legends? Anyone out there? I was going to ask. I have any fans of RPGs? Have we played it? Are we interested? I played it one time with uh, with Jenny, who plays Suki, and we did it for something online, which I was like, we have to do. We probably should just should do, do one. Yeah, we should. And we should that stream sounds it. great. It's very fun. Of course, I played a, a firebender named Ezra. I just, it was cool. <laughs> the thing is, that it, we did it like a short campaign for online, so it was only a few hours, and I wanted to to be a, like a longer, more drawn out campaign because it has a lot of different, uh, just things that are very unique to it that's not in regular D&D &D games. So I wanna, cool. inv you know, we should do that. You'd have, you guys would be great. I, I would love to. Do they have a mechanic for like calculating taxes on tea sales? Like if you, <laughs> is that a, I just really, there's different parts of the world that we all want to explore. <laughs> you can make it a whole new world, a whole new era. <laughs> it's possible. Now, I want to ask about recording the series. Um, you know, some of you recorded together. Zach, you were far, far away. We only heard your voice. But were there any memories that really stick out to you during the recording process that you can share? Um, this, is, this is funny. Uh, in, maybe it was one of the podcasts that I did with Dante and Janet or, or some other interview relatively recently. Um, Dante, I feel like it was with you. We were talking about the Great Divide and how that's like universally considered. Like people don't like that episode. I don't. I'm sorry if that's not the truth. Um, but I, I had said in that interview, I was like, I really have vivid memories of recording that episode. And it hit me a few months later that that was completely manufactured. It's because there's the videos of us in the booth doing it. There's that exists on YouTube that I've seen a million times. It's not an that actual was the memory. Great I've divide, just seen the video. Which probably also, if my memory serves, I think the footage of us recording it was 
re-record, like, was Oh, yeah. Fake. Yeah, oh, I, that definitely. Absolutely. I think, like, it was like, they came in on a day while we were doing ADR, so they were like, just say some of the lines from the episode. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like a double fake memory. Complete yeah. illusion. So no memories of the... No, zero. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got none. <laughs> we were children. It's gone by yeah, now. I mean, like, well, it was so different for me, just being alone and, and the... Uh, voices were just coming through my headphones. I mean, I, I, it would, it, I always had engineers and, and family on the other side with me, but I never really acted opposite you guys, which made it difficult for me and also for you. Um, but it's the magic of television, how that can work out. And yeah. like, we can really sound like we're having a conversation. And the magic of Andre Romano, oh the voice God. director. Yes, shout out to there. Andre Romano. Like, Andre is incredible. That specifically is such a skill to see both sides of these of these dialogue exchanges and know like, okay, if I get this from them and I get this from here and I remember what they did, so if we get something, like she just really held those scenes together in her head in an incredible way that made, made it feel like we had uh, great chemistry. I, I still, to this day, <laughs> don't know how she did it. And we did, somehow. We did. Yeah, but like we <laughs> meeting for the second time ever, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, it was fun that we were all in the studio together because I was, because my memories of it is definitely, well, Jack being late. A lot. Yeah, occasionally. Occasionally. Oh, I've heard. He was a college student. Yeah, I was a college student. And we were like, we're, we're waiting on Jack. All right, let's wait on Jack. And then, uh, I mean, Mako, the, who passed away, who was, played Uncle Iroh, the original actor of Uncle Iroh. Rest in peace, Mako. A lot of those scenes are very special because we were in the room together, working together, and he had played my uncle or my father several times in my career, so really wonderful. Again, Jason Isaacs, walking in the room with Jason Isaacs, it's kind of scary. I was going to say, yeah. You're like, damn. And his voice, you know, he's in the back of you and he's talking. You're like, damn, that guy, that's Lucius Malfoy. I'm scared of him. <laughs> and then when I got to work with my father, Fire Lord Ozai, and I didn't realize who was playing my father, and Andrea Romano was like, oh, yeah, Mark's going to come in to play your dad. He'll be here in a bit. I'm like, okay. And then the door swings open, and it's Mark Hamill. <laughs> I, I recognize that guy from somewhere. So weird and crazy. I'm fangirling. Of course, I'm fangirling. And then it's, it's just daunting, very daunting to have a fight and yell and kind of talk to your father in a way that's, and it's, it's Mark Hamill. <laughs> but these memories are crazy. And then yeah. just Jack and Maeve, a lot of times it's just us three. That was the main, that was the main crew. And then, and then. Uh, Michaela, Jesse Flower, as she joined, was was often in that. She was very small. Very tiny. Um, yeah, that's most of my memories, too, was just, like, getting to work with this cast um, and 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 uh, getting to... My, my like, uh, favorite thing to get to view as a cast member was I would occasionally show up early when not very late um, to get to see D. Bradley Baker of do course. ADR. Like when he would come in and match the picture and just like they would just point at a, an animal in the back and he would create the most like beautiful and perfect sound from places in his head that I didn't know could make sound. Uh, that was like my favorite thing to watch. That I'm jealous of. It was very cool. I got to meet him and like, he would do them live, but like seeing him, the artist at work, oh my God. It's probably so cool. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be my last question, and then I'm going to, and I want to open it up to all of you. So there are two microphones, one right here and one right there, so feel free to start lining up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Except we have no time for questions. Boom, April Fool's prank, yes! <laughs> so my last question for all of you is, we talked about memories. I want to ask about storylines, not necessarily of just your characters, but characters within the show itself. Were there any particular storylines you loved watching unfold? Yeah, I mean, Zuko's redemption arc is legitimately, uh, it, was, it was a, at the time, it felt like a, a marvel that we were making. It was just like, wow, this is so cool, feels really impactful. Um, was then, was just like uh, fun of like, oh, now we, we've been in the booth with Dante for two years not really interacting that much. <laughs> and then, and now like, oh, we get to work with him and explore this character in a new way. Um, but just start to finish, um, minus this whole episode of exposition that I never saw. Um, <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a beautiful arc that I was like, one of the many things about this show that was really astounding, like as we were cracking scripts to go like, man, this, we're really doing a lot. 
I don't think I don't think I had the vocabulary then to really like talk about character arcs and things like that. I was you know like a preteen, but like just the memory of like getting the script in the mail, opening it, and reading through it, and like me imagining what's going on, and then months later getting the ADR tapes and seeing the final cut and like seeing how it all played out was just really fascinating, um, and just seeing how my work, which again was isolated from your guys was able to just fit in and, and make sense in context and everything. It's just really cool to play out, cool to watch play out. Um, you just reminded me of something I, was gonna, I want to ask you because you know, now you get scripts and most of the time they just email the scripts, of course. Back in those days, every week they would mail us, they'd FedEx us the script. Yep. Like the week before and you kind of get to do your notes and you can write all your notes on the script and when you do it, you go in the booth, you write out all the notes in the script. And of course, none of us knew this show was going to be as important as it is. I would have kept all those scripts <laughs> and had them locked up somewhere. The original scripts of Avatar, the complete season, yeah. complete series would be, had been great or sold it and bought a condo. But I have, <laughs> I have none of those scripts. Did you keep any of those FedEx scripts? My, my parents definitely have a number of them. How many? I don't know, but there are boxes. Oh, dude, basically. you got to get a condo. Oh, yeah, I need a are condo. You I you guys want to go in on a scripts. condo? Oh, yeah. yeah. I have I none. Care. Do you have any of those scripts? Uh, none. Not a single one. Me? <laughs> <laughs> we left in your UCLA what dorm room. You do, this, you do the thing, and then Andrea says goodbye, you're done, and then you take the script, and then you throw it in the trash. Politely take the brads out. Yeah, and then you're like, throw it, throw it away <laughs> and say bye. Uh, I lived in Irvine at the time, which is... Uh, a bit of a drive from LA. Very far. <laughs> yeah, and people, so there was like a courier service that would have to bring it yeah. to my house every every night before Before email. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have crazy. DHL? I had DHL, that, that truck every week coming, coming, coming through the in, neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but as far as story storylines, I would, I loved seeing Uncle Iroh and going, <laughs> yes, amazing. What I want to see is the Dragon of the West when you find out you know, he's so chill, and we all aspire to be, myself included, Uncle Iroh someday. But to get to that place of zen sagefulness, I want to see how the pendulum swing the other way during the war. And yeah, he I is mean, the dragon just, of the West. Even just seeing him, like, rock push-ups in the jail. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, this guy's, oh, yeah. got, this guy's got incredible. something. I want to know more about what's popping off with Uncle Iroh. All right, let's go into some fan questions. Let's start with Avatar Aang. Hi guys, I'm Patrick. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, my question is, if the three of you were forced to go back in time and play a, one of the other characters that you guys played, who would it be and why? That, like, like you, swap each other's roles? Because yeah. my answer is Jet. I want to be cool enough to be Jet. <laughs> no Jet, no Jet. We don't no like Jet, that. okay. <laughs> I want to do Jet also, but... We'd like to all do Jet. We'd like to do like a Greek choral performance of Jet. Uh, I'd love to be Sokka. I'm probably not that good. I, I was very... It was a good time. It, it was, was great to watch Jack do Sokka, and I'd be like watching him do things and try different takes on certain lines, and so, so funny. So I was just jealous, because I was just in the other room just being angsty. Also, we... <laughs> You were in specifically like an isolation booth the whole time? Yeah, sometimes they put me in an isolation booth. In the, which usually you use an isolation booth if two people are in a scene a lot together and they're going to be like yelling over yeah, each other. Yeah. But it was not. You were in an isolation booth while May and I, who had a ton of seats together, were just sitting next to each other. And then I'm just by sad. myself. Yeah. And I, sometimes I took a nap. <laughs> they're like, Dante, it's your line. Dante, hello? Every booth was an isolation booth for me, so... Um, uh, to answer your question, Patrick, uh, I mean, Zuko is definitely my favorite character. He's got the best arc, undoubtedly. But I don't think I could do a villain. Um, I would have loved a shot at, at playing Zuko. Definitely could not have done a better job than Jack. Uh, but, or uh, Sokka, I'm so sorry. Um, but, like, being the comic relief character, that's, that's, that's great. It was, must have been really fun for you. It was very fun. I had a great time. Uh, <laughs> I, t I feel the same way. Of like, I don't. The think question, I, I don't Jack, think is: Would you the... be Sokka? Would you be Sokka? Would you rather be Zuko or Aang? I That's think the I would, question. I think I feel the same as Zach. That like taking on, like the the heft of the villainy that you carried, I think would be, would be tough. I, yeah, I don't think I'm naturally unlikable enough to be a. Uh, 
No, what I, my sincere actual thing is I don't think I'm cool enough to play Jet or Zuko. You bring, you bring like so much cool to that character that like you immediately, it's, it's the reason everyone wanted to see this redemption arc is just like, I wanna like that guy. There is something so likable. Not at the, be the very beginning. The very beginning, and with that real high ponytail, it's just like, this guy sucks. <laughs> questionable, questionable haircut for a while. But once the hair gets cool, it's like, ah, oh, I want to be that guy. Um, I would say Aang, yeah. I would say Aang, I think, like, because there is a ton of comedy in Aang, too. So that's, like, that was, I think, like, we got a lot of fun joke exchanges, and then you also are carrying all this, like, big, beautiful weight um, and these, like, juicy-ass monologues. Um, so, yeah, I'd say, yeah, yeah, I'd say Aang. Good. But we can all agree on Jet, though. We're, we're, we're settling it's on Jet. It's Jet. We're yeah. doing Greek choral performance. We all want to do Jack. We all want to be a cool terrorist chewing a little <laughs> stra straw. That's cool. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Hi, um, I'm Sarah from Lansing, Michigan, and I... Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm ecstatic to be here. Um, but my question is, um, in the finale of the show, we kind of ended on like a cliffhanger. It was Zuko saying, where's my mom? And so I, I was wondering if there was any like talk or expectation of there being like more to the show, more to the series, if there was gonna be more. And if there was, you know, even talk now, would you guys consider like coming back for the, the question, where is Zuko's mom? We recorded season four and they lost the files. Boom, April Fools, I got you. You guys keep falling for this. Um, well, uh, first of all, I appreciate the Fire Nation dress. <laughs> and uh, but they, they, yeah, of course, when, when that was going on, I thought, we like, well, who knows if there's gonna be a spinoff or anything, but they went in and when, in the comics and they explained the Zuko's mother, which is amazing in the search. Uh, as far as going back, I think we all love the characters. We'd always you know, depending on the circumstance, whatever they're with the characters, uh, we'd always love to revisit, but, um, but yeah, you read, I've read the comics now, and I just finished The Rise of Kyoshi, both books, and The Dawn of Young Chen. So they are going deeper and heavier into the storyline, into the canon, through the stories, and so I can't wait to see what Avatar Studios comes up with for the future. Yeah. Yeah. I, at the... I've heard subsequently that there was like conversations about season four and stuff, but at the time it definitely felt like we were only doing three. Like I was being I told at that the time, too. like yeah. they had conceived of this like closed arc three season thing. So while they were planting some seeds for like, here's other story elements that we could explore in other areas when we have the time, it definitely felt like, okay, this is, this is the journey we're going on together. It has reached a logical conclusion. Yeah. Um, so it did feel to us when recording it quite, final and complete. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine that Mike and Brian in their heads then just had so much more of this world are, you know, conceived. Um, so whether or not they were really setting up a fourth book, I don't know, because yeah, I, I, I really, I was always told that it was a set three, but um, you know, now with everything else in the extended universe, like they, they had that in their heads because they're, they're just geniuses. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Hello, my name is Alyssa, I'm from Central Illinois. My question is, um, during your time during the show, what was something that was impactful enough for you that made you just grow as a person? Uh, Hopefully it's not too complicated. No. <laughs> being, you know, 16, 17 when we started and then being like a uh, freshman in college and coming to, to uh, the studio every week to record, the just like being in this incredible professional environment of like just wildly talented people at all these different jobs, getting to work with Dante and May and all the other voice actors that were coming through, getting to work with Andrea, getting to work with these writers and creators, um, taught me a ton about professionalism and the creative process, that show always felt very collaborative. It felt like you were able to ask the right questions of the writers and get interesting feedback and try new things. Um, so I'd say like as an artist, I grew a ton getting to work in such a beautiful, talented, collaborative environment. 
I think I, I like personally like I, and I think I, you many of you would agree that I've learned a lot of like life lessons from Aang and, and the wisdom that he teaches, and also Uncle Iroh. I think that those two characters really have a lot to impart. Um, uh, something in particular that I remember, like I, when I got the script for like the Guru Patik episodes, um, learning about spiritualism and, and chakras and all that kind of stuff. That was really my first foray into any of that. Um, and I always thought that was really cool how they kind of introduced that into a, a series that was intended for kids, not a kid series. Um, but yeah, you know, there, there was so much to learn from, from the scripts, uh, whether life lessons or, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was not a kid. <laughs> No, but I. But during the shooting, during the filming of it all and the taping of it, um, Mako passed away, who I said was the original Uncle Iroh and had played my uncle or my father several times in my life, and it was very heavy and emotional for the whole, a lot of us in the cast going through it. And in his passing, he just was very still Uncle Iroh to me. He he started a, a theater company uh, called East West Players that I grew up with in L.A., which is a, an Asian American theater company. And I've written plays there and done plays there. And even in his passing, he was very, I don't know, there's like a thing that came over me that I realized like I was in the same lineage of, of Asian artists in Hollywood as him. And it was time for me now to kind of create something to pass on to the next generation. That's when I started producing Asian American films during that time. So thank you. And it's it kind of it's like Uncle Iroh speaking to you even as passing like it's time for you to kind of pass on to the next generation. So it's all during this this era. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi, I'm Jerome Green from Chicago, Illinois. Water Tribe, by the way. Yeah. Water Tribe. <laughs> nice people in the Thank Water you. Tribe. Nice, nice people. Uh, I would like to know, uh, Dante, how was it working with Robin on Hook? Man, Robin Williams is amazing. Rest in peace. Uh, he was one. He was one of the best to ever do it. And he was my memories. I was a child at that time, 15 years old, and he was such a nurturing and just amazing mentor for me at that time. I'd, I'd show up on my set. I'd show up on the set my days off to see him work, see him and Dustin Hoffman work, and see him improv and. Uh, you know, one of my special memories is really mornings with him because Dead Poet Society is one of my favorite films, especially at that time. And yes, and I write poetry. I'm a poet, but we would spend mornings talking about poetry. His favorite poems, his favorite poets, my favorite poems. I'd show him some of my poems. So uh, he's just a special guy. A, a crazy thing, how special he is, it's like, we started, me and my brothers and my crew, we started our own Dead Poets Society, right? And it's the address to this place we do write poems at. It's called 13607 and a half was the address. And so that was the name of the crew, 13607 and a half. And then I got a hat made for them at Compton Indoor Swap Meet that had the name of the crew embroidered in it. And then underneath it, it said, oh, captain, my captain from the movie, right? <laughs> yes. And so I gave it to him on set all these years ago, and he's passed away and whatnot, and his daughter, Zelda Williams, who was on Cora, it's part of the Avatar family, I ran into her uh, at a restaurant or a bar in LA one time we're talking, and we're, we're gonna catch up and have lunch, and then she goes, hey, she texts me like a few days later, and she's like, I was going through my dad's stuff, and look what I found, and she sent me a picture of the hat. So rest in peace, Rob Williams. Hello. You look like an earthbender. I mean, you all look handsome. Hey. <laughs> ah. How y'all doing first? Welcome to Chicago, guys. Thank you. Welcome to the, uh, the crazy weather. We were loving Chicago, but we have to leave in five minutes. Got you again, you guys! <laughs> oh, man. You guys have seen me before, probably, from yesterday. <laughs> uh, name's Adam, from here, Chicago. Hey, guys. <laughs> Uh, so I have to ask, so you guys oh, basically went through this whole many years, through this, oh, this experience. Did you have a favorite moment in the show or like, oh, with Mako-san? Like, he, I was talking to you yesterday, Dante, about if you had any lesson and, oh, you wanted to part with, oh, with, oh, from Mako. Oh, or 
something that you guys hold right here that you enjoy to keep that you can't you can always go oh, back like remember that any special moments from the show or any I'll say a side one which is um, watching the finale together they had like a big cast and crew um, it was when we actually finally yeah. got to in person yeah. uh, interact um, the like four part finale season three they did it like in a in a theater with like full cast and crew and like so that's a lot of people you never get to see working on it eh, storyboard artists and stuff who you're not really interacting with while we're just in a booth and getting to see the totality in the audience and the totality on screen of like what we created and how we created it and who we all were um that was really cool that's a special experience that i really um look back fondly on of just uh i i just love the collaborative environment of uh, making any, any art, but television is such a like long pipeline, there's so many people involved, that getting to be in a room and go like, I am this little cog in this giant thing, and look at this, you know, I don't know, 600 people or whatever who have created this thing, and that's, you know, not including a lot of the 2D hand animation done in South Korea that, were like, I think some of the artists came out, but just being part of this big collective creating this really beautiful thing um, is something I always hold. Yeah, I, I, personally I think like it, it was a bit of a blur looking back now, and like to be completely honest, but so much more of like my, like what the show means to me has come afterwards and seeing like how fans have received it and how long it's lasted um, and, and coming to this, my first con and just seeing all these years later how impactful it can still be. Um, that I think is really like what has like kind of shaped uh, my memory. I, I, like just because I was so young when I did it, I was again isolated. Um, that that really like I think what you're asking like has come later for me. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's all blur. I mean, it's years ago, many years ago, and we're doing a lot of different work. And really, what Zuko and what the show represents to me is. Uh, it's kind of like, don't know so much, like have this room to be surprised. Like it reminds me to leave room in life to be surprised because this, it was great doing the show and it was, I thought the story was amazing. I, we made some really good friends, Jack and May, and we did this great project together, but it's not something that I, I knew what was going to become of it or what it was gonna be or the impact it was gonna have. Um, you know, we act in front of the camera, do voices. I, I write, produce, direct, th these things are, you're making all these stories. But what it, a character like this, a show like this, can change the world, and you may not even know it. And so that's what it, it reminds me, is like, hey, just leave room to be surprised. That there are things that are happening that you may not have any control over that's gonna be more exciting than you can possibly imagine. Thank you, guys, and thank, thank you, my fire lord. <laughs> Hi, Zuko here. Um, my name's actually Alice. I'm from Chicago. Unlike a lot of people I know, I've been doing kung fu for 10 years, and when I first watched the series, unlike most people who got inspired to do kung fu through the series. So have y'all, do y'all have any martial arts experience? Uh, Dante, I know you did some sword work on Hook, but have you dove into the wonderful world of Chinese martial arts since? or anything? I did a fair amount of Tai Chi in college, and it was like when we were That's recording, good. it was like, yeah. it was just like a class I was taking at college, but it was like while we were recording Avatar, and, and Water Tribe is heavily influenced by Tai Chi, so it was a, uh, yeah, it was a cool, I was like learning this, and I was like, I could do it, I could bend. <laughs> like if they needed me to, I got it. <laughs> Absolutely. No, um, I, <laughs> Well, growing up, I did study uh, Kajin Kembo, the style I grew up in, uh, to Orange Belt. I was still an Orange Belt in Kajin Kembo. Nice. Yeah, you never lose that, man. Fire Nation color was stopped there. <laughs> but no, and while we were doing the show, I did study a bit with Sifu Kisu and was learning some of, uh, some of the fire, just the firebending stuff and the Shaolin stuff 
and the Chinese Kung Fu, but I did not go deeper into it. I mean, I've had done Brian, other. Brian, right, was studying. Brian like, was Netsuka, deep one into of the greatest, it, yeah. was yeah, yeah. super deep into it with Sifu Kisu. Yes, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I dabbled, let's put it that way. I would say I dabbled, but I would love to, you know, maybe I'm at a time in life where I can study again. I don't, I, you know, other, other masters were like, you should study. I'm like, I'm not ready. <laughs> You're waiting for your hips to get... I don't know, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> I think I reached uh, yellow belt with, like, two stripes, maybe. Two stripes, karate yellow belt. when I was, like, seven or eight. So if you guys want to spar later, we okay. can uh, <laughs> make that happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's about as, as far as I got. I did have a karate birthday party. So there's that. Did you, did you cut the, the cake with the samurai sword? Oh, I don't think my parents sprung for that option. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Zuko also here. Yeah. Another Zuko. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Destiny. I'm also from Chicago. Um, I just want to know, like, what were your favorite parts of being able to voice your, like, individual characters? Because the show is just so dynamic where it's like, it was a kid's show. It was, like, on Nickelodeon. So, like, it had a lot of funny times, but it also touched upon, like, a lot of heavy and serious topics. So you guys all had, like, also a lot of serious things that you're like acting with and I was just curious like what were your favorite parts that you remember having to um, do? Yeah I'll say it was a very very fun experience to be like comedic relief on a show like this. They were there would be a very playful collaborative environment when we were doing particularly like jokey like the cactus juice stuff was very just like get in here let's play let's try a bunch of stuff. Uh, it'll quench you. It'll quench you. <laughs> It's the quenchiest. Uh, so that was the stuff that regularly was very exciting and very fun. And when we started, I kind of just assumed that's what I was going to be doing for as many seasons as we made the show, just like getting a bunch of really fun jokes. Um, so to then later start cracking scripts where they're like, oh, no, they're really like challenging this character and having this character evolve too, that this is also, the comedic relief is also going to have a big arc and going to grow, um, was really cool to, to, like, by the end of season one, be like, okay, now I'm like, oh, I'm like, uh, we're in the north and I'm like falling in love and then, oh, oh boy, don't want to read that yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was really, it was just a, a, a beautiful gift as an actor to get to explore a character like that. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, again, I, I, I think I, don't, I didn't really know where the story was going. I wasn't even thinking about where the story was going. It was kind of later on, book two, book three, we were like, this is crazy. These things are happening. I really just thought I was going to be a villain. Ult first, when I first signed on to the show, and they showed me the picture of Zuko with that ponytail. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the scar. Because me and, me and May were both doing... Uh, uh, American Dragon Jake Long. Yes. Uh, on Disney. And that was like more like a sitcom-y comedy. But me and May were both doing that. And then we both got offered this other thing to do. And I was like, oh, we have another show. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'll just be the, the, the hero on, on Disney. And I'll be the villain on Nickelodeon. <laughs> Little did I know what was going to happen with this character. And I haven't seen... American Dragon, but does he have a villain arc? Does it be? Does he become? He ends up going <laughs> the other way. Yeah, wow. Cool. <laughs> so, I think one of the when when you're doing a weekly show, the the joy of it sometimes is just kind of being in the moment and trying to fulfill each of these scenes. And with Zuko, he I I don't know what he was doing. I mean, he was a, I was happy for him. I'm upset with him, like everybody else. What is he doing? I'm with the gang. I'm not. I'm leaving the gang. You know. I'm going with Azula for some dumb reason. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Um, but it was, I just went on the roller coaster ride with everybody else in each week. When you're in the booth, you're just trying to fulfill like that scene at that moment and do a good job, especially when you have someone like Andrea. You're just, you're not foreshadowing at all. You're just like, what am I trying to do right now? And so when you're kind of doing that moment to moment stuff and you look at it later on, years later, you're like, oh. That was what's going on. So hopefully in life, it's going to work out too. You know? I think we all like Zuko because we all want to be redeemed for something in our life, in our lives. I, I, I started to touch on it before, just like how, how much 
life lessons you can learn from the show. And, and like, again, a lot of that came later with rewatching it and, and seeing just like how really, really deep the show can get in so many different topics, whether it's like the geopolitical conflict and the ways that that takes shape and how that reflects the real world, um, or just like the wisdom, um, you know, of the characters. Um, and, and yeah, just opening the script, reading that through was just a, it was a great experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to know as a kid, because how old were you when you did it? How old were you? Like, I was like 10 to 14. So how cool was it that you knew you were the Avatar? <laughs> At 10 years old, like it was I, pretty cool. It's cool, yeah. right? <laughs> That's all. I and it still know. is. <laughs> it gotta be like you're 10, like I'm the Avatar. Yeah. The series is called Avatar. It's called Avatar, and so, I'm the Avatar. Yeah. So guess what? That's me. Yeah. Hi, guys. My name is Sandra. I'm from Chicago. And seeing you guys here um, a week before I moved to LA to pursue animation is just an amazing send off. <laughs> amazing. Um, I was one of the OG fans. I watched the show back in the early 2000s, and it inspired me to change career paths and go into animation and study it. And I was just so inspired um, to just make it in animation production. Zach, it's awesome to see you. I just wanted to say one thing before I ask my question. So, you are alive after all. I had a thought you'd survived, but it doesn't matter. I've known about the invasion for months. Gray, is that you? <laughs> Pretty good. I had, I had other messages for Jack and Dante, but I don't want to waste any more time. Um, Don't scare question, me. Don't scare me. <laughs> a PTS. My question is, um, have you been approached by people like me in, over the years who have been inspired to pursue animation and voiceover, voice directing, um, and what have been the words of advice and wisdom that you've given them? So many. I mean, I love... Uh, I love having this conversation because we're all artists and I love coming to cons because we're, this is our people. We're, this is a community of creatives worldwide. Every Comic Con consists of actors and cosplayers and illustrators and designers and just that's one of the things that I love to come to the con and be a part, a part of this community. So the people that choose to move on and go to the next level and try to make it their profession or, and try to live with it, you know, uh, I always wish him good luck on the journey, for sure. I've been an actor, like I said, we've all been kid actors, but I've been an actor for over 37 years and gone on to film, filmmaking and directing and writing. It always comes down to first knowing your craft, getting good at your craft. You know, you need a little bit of luck. The better you get, the luckier you'll get, for sure. And then I always want to remind people whether that they're in any kind of acting, voice acting, be, it's a good acting. But if you're going to be an, an, a, an artist, be a, a good, art, a great artist even. And as much as we dive into other stories and other characters and we do these other things, I, I always try to remind them, it actually always is going to come back down to you. You. The, there's a million people coming to LA, to Hollywood, to New York, to do the industry. And there's a million things that people can do and they're going to ask you to do. And there's one thing that none of them can do. It's you. And so the courage to find yourself and put yourself in everything that you do is your one piece of like magic that you can bring, that no one else can bring to everything you're doing. So get good at everything else. Get as good as you can. Get it, that's, that's your job. But the courage and the magic is always going to come back to you. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. My, like, one other piece of advice that I, I think about a lot is, like, try as often as possible to be the least talented person in the room. Like, go into spaces 100%. where you know you're, like, going to have to punch way above your weight and where you're going to be able to absorb stuff from people who are more experienced or more talented or whatever. And, you know, obviously, all of that is personal perception or whatever. But, like, be the... Oh, yeah, here we go. Ready? An avatar thing. Be the non-bender in the room, right? Like, get, find, go be... Of course, Sokka says that. You know? Be the heart. 
be the one who goes like, oh wow, all these people are incredible at all this stuff, and how do I like rise to that level? That's I think a challenge that if you set that for yourself as often as possible, you're gonna keep growing and growing. Absolutely. That's so good. Yeah. You could that, do that's that great talk. And, that? and when you, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, well, when you find yourself in those spaces, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I'm sure we've all heard that a million times, but it's true. Um, you're there to learn. You will learn, you will get better, and just keep creating. Just don't stop. Do you, and the best of luck to you in your career. Hi, I'm Katie, I'm from Lansing, Michigan. Hi, the other person. Um, my question is, if there's someone in this room or out there who hasn't seen Avatar, what would you tell them to get them to watch the show? What would it mean for you to, what would you want them to know? Just like if you're wondering how to run a tea shop, like how long to steep jasmine, how much. Uh, I don't, I mean, the magic thing for me with Avatar, would, it, would it, 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 it's kind of influenced a lot, if not, all or most of the animation that's come after it, um, it depends how this person's like. If you're already on the anime, that's another thing. Like, you're already in, deep in the water. <laughs> but this is, like, look, when I grew up, when I grew up, cartoons were very black and white in the sense of they're Autobots and Decepticons, and we looked, at a, <laughs> we looked at the world in a certain way. And especially when you're young, your mind's developing, and you kind of get these perceptions of the world and whatnot. Avatar happened, and you get to see that the world is much more gray and much more like it is. There's four, yeah, there's this epic story of, of, these, of this gang trying to save the world. There are four elements, but these four elements, there's good and bad in every element. And the, the characters, we don't know who's the heroes, who's the villains. Things change as they do in life. Like, this is the kind of story that that can change the world. One of the craziest stories I tell, I'm at New York Comic Con and I'm signing an autograph for, for this kid. Well, he's doing his 20s now and he's like, thank you, know, I grew up with you. I'm like, I'm glad you grew up with us. And he's like, no, no, you don't get it. And he goes, I go, what? He goes, you programmed our generation. I said, what? <laughs> he goes, Avatar, you guys, you programmed our generation. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, why, why do you think we're the generation that brought back protests? Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement. He goes, we're trying to bring the world back in balance. Oh! Crazy. I can't follow that. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. So before, this will be our last question, unfortunately, but Everyone here is so excited to see all of you. So before everyone heads out after this last question, could we all take a picture with all of these amazing people? Yeah! Woo, yeah! Right. What? Oh, question first? Oh my god. I thought yes, was question, question first. Question, question right. first. <laughs> Can we do two? We got one yes. more. Yes, 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 yes. We'll, we'll, we'll do two more questions, awesome. you, and then we'll go right over here. Well, my name is Mary, I'm from Chicago, shout out to Rogers Park, and <laughs> yeah, that's what I like to hear. So, um, I'm the kid of immigrants, I'm a little sister, and what was amazing about Avatar to me growing up was its commitment to the family dynamic, right? You have siblings, uncles, all of these relationships, plus like the way that the gang evolves over time and also the themes of chosen family, as well as the family that you already have in your life. So I was just wondering, how did your personal relationships with your family, your parents, your siblings, influence the characters that you played? And did you ever bring those feelings of your own family into the way that you brought kind of the gang and the families together throughout the series? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm one of five siblings. I'm the middle child. Um, so I am a little brother. And I'm, I am an older brother. And I have a sister. She has some Azula energy sometimes. <laughs> If I have brothers, and I have, and I have a close-knit group of friends that are, that are family, so I think definitely that, that, that played somewhere in my playing of Zuko. Yeah, I definitely, Sokka is the older brother, and I definitely brought a lot of younger brother <laughs> energy to it, very intentionally. I was like, yeah, he's like trying to be a leader in this way, but I am a very obnoxious younger brother to my older sister, Jamie. 
Um, and I and I felt that some of that needed to shine through the like sort of friendly antagonism of a of a brother. I think I mean it, the crazy thing about Aang is that he ha he has nobody, uh, and you know I'm someone who's blessed to have a, a loving family. Um, and I think the only thing I could really draw from would be to like imagine not having that, and that's you know because it's not an experience that I've ever had. Uh, so just really just trying to imagine the absence of all of that is just how to create Aang in those moments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My, my name's Olivia, and I'm from Wisconsin. Hi, Olivia! What's your favorite movie to play in? Uh, what? <laughs> which, which movie do I play in? To play in. Hook. Hook is not bad. <laughs> um. My current favorite movie to, to like, uh, uh, pretend to be in is, I have a three-year-old, and she, for some reason, recently got very, very into the stage production of Newsies. That's on Disney. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time with my three-year-old, like, staging a union strike. Like, that's what she likes to... <laughs> right now, I feel like this is the, the last scene in Tar, if any of you have seen that movie. <laughs> they all sound good. I don't know. I mean, I think, yeah, I think... I think Hook would be good. I love... I still love Lost Boys and Pirates and everything. Bangarang, bangarang, you guys. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank, Thank you, Olivia. You. Thanks, Olivia. You're welcome.